We're continuing our discussion of spinners in 3D from a mathematical point of view. In the last couple videos, we've been using sigma matrices as basis vectors in the XYZ directions. This might lead you to ask what the sigma matrices actually are. Should we view them as basis vectors, like little arrows in 3D space in the XYZ directions, or should we view them as matrices? One answer to this question involves Clifford algebras, which I'll talk about in a later video. In this video, I'm going to try explaining the relationship between vectors and Pauli spinners by showing that the sigma matrices form a link between ordinary 3D space and a pair of two-dimensional spinner spaces. I'm going to show that the sigma matrices actually have three indices, one vector index, also called a tensor index, and a pair of spinner indices. The sigma matrices act as a link between tensor indices and spinner indices, allowing us to replace one tensor index with a pair of spinner indices. This means that you can use the sigmas to rewrite any tensor you've seen using spinner indices, which doubles the number of indices. This is related to the concept of the Infeld van der Waarden symbols. Although, the Infeld van der Waarden symbols are only used for space-time, and I will cover them more fully in the next video. To help explain this, we'll see that a poly vector can be written as the tensor product of a spinner and a dual spinner. Explaining all of this will require some basic understanding of tensor concepts as a prerequisite, like the tensor product and dual vectors, also called co-vectors. I'll go over a quick review of these concepts in this video, but I've included links in the description to my Tensors for Beginners series if you want a more in-depth explanation. Before we start, I want to correct a couple things from the previous video. When factoring a zero-determinant Pauli vector, I pulled this negative 1 outside the square root and wrote it as i. This is a bit problematic, because the square root of negative 1 can be either plus i or minus i. This leads to different sign conventions for the results. Although, this is expected since we already know there are multiple solutions for the spinner components. The most common convention in textbooks is to leave the negative sign under the square root, and get these formulas for the spinner components. Also, in previous videos I've been saying poly instead of Pauli. I still say it wrong in some parts of this video, but moving forward I'll try to use the correct pronunciation. Let's start by reviewing some basic tensor concepts. If I have a vector v living in two-dimensional space, I can write it as a linear combination of basis vectors e1 and e2, using components v1 and v2. Notice that I've written the indices on v1 and v2 as upper indices. These are not exponents. One reason for this is that basis vectors are often written in a row, and so the lower index tells us the position in the row. And vector components are often written in a column, and the upper indices tell us their position in the column. Another reason I've written the vector components with upper indices is because vector components are contravariant. Contravariant just means opposite change, meaning that vector components change in the opposite way that basis vectors do. For example, if this vector's components in this basis are 1, 1, if I double the length of the basis vectors by multiplying them by 2, then I must have the length of the components by multiplying them by one half, to get the components one half one half. The vector components changed in the opposite way that the basis vectors did. The basis vectors grew and the vector components shrunk. More generally, if I change basis vectors with a matrix, then I must change the vector components using the inverse matrix to balance the change out. I can also write this in summation notation like this. Some sources also choose to write these summation formulas without including summation symbols. 
You can tell a summation is happening whenever an upper index letter is matched with a lower index letter. This is called Einstein summation notation. Next, I'll introduce dual vectors, which go by many other names, including covectors and one forms. The bra vectors from quantum mechanics are just another name for dual vectors. Ordinary vectors are like arrows, and are good for representing objects with a length and a direction, such as velocity. Dual vectors are like oriented stacks, and are good for representing objects with a density and a direction, such as a traveling wave. Larger dual vectors correspond to denser stacks, and smaller dual vectors correspond to less dense stacks. A dual vector is a machine that takes a vector and outputs a scalar, just by counting the number of stack sheets that are pierced by the vector, which is 3 in this example. This idea of counting the number of stack sheets that a vector pierces gives these two linearity laws for dual vectors acting on vectors. The components of a dual vector alpha are given by counting how many stack sheets are pierced by the basis vectors. Here, the components of alpha are 3 and 2. As I said, vector components normally go in columns, with the upper index indicating their position in the column. Dual vector components normally go in rows, with their lower index indicating their position in the row. Dual vector components are written with lower indices because they are covariant. This means they change in the same way as basis vectors. Let's say we have this dual vector with components 2 and 4. If we double the length of the basis vectors, then they will pierce twice as many stack sheets. And so the dual vector components also double to 4 and 8. We can also define the dual basis written with epsilons. These are defined by this equation. If the dual vector index matches the vector index, we get 1, and if they don't match, we get 0. For example, epsilon 1 acting on E1 gives 1, and the same for epsilon 2 acting on E2. And if the indices don't match, we get 0, so epsilon 1 acting on E2 gives 0 and same with epsilon 2 acting on E1. Dual basis vectors are contravariant. If we double the length of the basis vectors, we must have the length of the dual vectors to make sure the equation stays true. As I said, vector components normally go in columns, with the upper index indicating their position in the column. Dual basis vectors with their upper indices also go in columns. When we have vectors living in a vector space V, we say that the dual vectors live in the corresponding dual vector space. This is often denoted by V star in many books, but I'm just going to write the dual space as V dual. We can do row column multiplications to get the scalar result of a covector acting on a vector. This is normally called the inner product. But we can also do column row multiplications to give us a 2 by 2 matrix, which functions as a linear map. This is normally called the outer product. This outer product array multiplication can also be written abstractly with symbols using this tensor product symbol. If we multiply this array product by a scalar, we can distribute the scalar to either the column or the row. The tensor product also obeys this rule, where we can distribute the scalar either to the left entry or to the right entry. Also, if we have a column multiplied over a sum of rows, we can distribute over the rows. Similarly, if we have a sum of columns multiplied by a row, we can distribute the row over the columns. The tensor product follows similar rules, where if we have a sum on the right side, we can distribute over it. The same goes for distributing over a sum on the left side of the tensor product. Some matrices like this one 
can be written as the product of a single column times a single row. Or in abstract notation, the tensor product of a single vector and a single dual vector. However, other matrices like this one, whose determinants are non-zero, cannot be written as a single column times a single row. Instead, we break these apart into a sum of matrices, one for each component. Bringing the scaling factors outside, each of these matrices now has a determinant of zero. So we can factor them into a column and a row. This shows that we can write any matrix as a sum of column row products, scaled by the appropriate coefficients. The same is true for tensor products. Any linear map can be written as a linear combination of tensor products of basis vectors and basis dual vectors, all scaled by the appropriate coefficients. I should also mention that in quantum mechanics, vectors are often written with the ket notation, and dual vectors are often written with the bra notation. The inner product is then written as a bra ket and the outer product is written as a ket bra, which can include or omit the tensor product symbol depending on the book. All of this reasoning that we've used for vectors can also be used for spinners. We have spinners which live in a spinner space S, and dual spinners which live in the dual spinner space S dual. I'm going to denote spinners by bold letters. Let's say that we have a spinner Xi that lives in S. A general spinner can be written as a linear combination of basis spinners with lower indices, and spinner components with upper indices. We can also write this in column row notation like this, or in summation notation like this. Similarly, a dual spinner zeta that lives in S dual can be written as a linear combination of dual basis spinners with upper indices, and dual spinner components with lower indices. Again, we can write this in column row notation and summation notation. As you would expect, basis spinners are covariant, and spinner components are contravariant. Dual spinner components are covariant, and dual basis spinners are contravariant. We can also do inner products of spinners, which gives a scalar, and outer products of spinners. So, so far, it doesn't seem like there's much of a difference between vectors and spinners. They both live in what is formally called a vector space. They both obey the same rules. The difference between them lies in their relationship with each other. In the last video, we learned that we can take a Pauli vector with a determinant of zero and write it as the product of a column spinner and a row spinner. And I'm going to rewrite the components of the row spinner using zeta with lower indices, treating it as a dual spinner. On an abstract level, what we're doing here is writing a Pauli vector as the tensor product of a spinner and a dual spinner. More generally, if a Pauli vector has a non-zero determinant, we can break it up into four matrices, each with zero determinant, then write each of those as a column spinner times a row spinner. More abstractly, we write this as a sum of tensor products between basis spinners and dual basis spinners, like this. We can also write these outer products in bra ket notation if we want. Looking at the V components, the upper index specifies the position in the left column, or which row in the matrix. And the lower index specifies the position in the right row, or which column of the matrix. Each of the sigma matrices can be written this way as well. For example, we can write sigma x as a linear combination of matrices broken into column row products. More abstractly, this is a linear combination of tensor products of spinners and dual spinners. The same can be done for sigma y and sigma z. Looking at these three formulas, we have 12 coefficients that tell us how to sum all these tensor products together. 
So now let's answer the question, what actually are the sigmas? Well, sigma is actually a linear map, from the ordinary 3D vector space V to the four-dimensional space of spinner-dual-spinner -spinner pairs, which is S tensor S dual. If we take our EX basis vector from ordinary 3D space and act on it with sigma, we get a linear combination of the four basis elements of the space S tensor S dual. The coefficients are 0, 1, 1, 0, which are exactly the entries of the matrix sigma X. We can do the same thing with EY and get the coefficients 0, plus I, negative I, 0, which are the entries of sigma Y. And with EZ, we get the coefficients 1, 0, 0, negative 1, which are the entries of sigma Z. We can label these 12 coefficients using sigma with three indices. To explain why these indices make sense, let's review an ordinary linear map L from 3D space with one basis, mapping to another 3D space with another basis, with tildes on top. If we act on E1 with L, the output vector is some linear combination of the three tilde basis vectors. The coefficients are written L with a 1 as the lower index because the input vector was the E1 basis vector with a lower index. The upper indices are written 1, 2, 3 to match with the indices of the three E tilde basis vectors. We can get similar sets of coefficients for L of E2 and L of E3. Notice that these raised indices of the coefficients are opposite the lowered indices for the basis vectors they are associated with. This is because the upper coefficient index and the lower basis vector index are summed together, and so they must have opposite elevations. Now let's look at the linear map sigma acting on a basis vector EX. The output is a linear combination of the four spinner dual spinner products. Each of the coefficients are written as sigmas with a lower x index, to match the lower x index in the EX basis vector. We then require a pair of spinner indices to tell us which basis element the coefficients are associated with. Labeled with 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 2. Note that the component indices are written with opposite elevations compared to the basis elements. For example, the basis element with a lower 2 and upper 1 is matched with a coefficient with an upper 2 and a lower 1. We can do something similar for EY and EZ. And we can summarize all three of these formulas using Einstein's summation notation. So when we map a general 3D vector, small v, through the linear map sigma, we can apply the linear map to each basis vector individually, with the components brought out in front. We get a linear combination in our four-dimensional space of spinner-dual-spinner -spinner products. And these are the four entries of the corresponding Pauli vector, big V. We can also write this as an array multiplication, or as this summation. So the linear map sigma forms a link between our ordinary 3D vector space V and the 4D space of spinner dual spinner products. When we wrote a 3D vector small v in the form of a Pauli vector big V, we were really putting the small v vector through the linear map sigma and writing it in the space of spinner dual spinner tensor products. This is what allows us to factor certain Pauli vectors into a spinner and a dual spinner. Note that all Pauli vectors can be represented in our spinner pair space, but not every element of our spinner pair space corresponds to a Pauli vector. Pauli vectors must be traceless and Hermitian matrices, and our 4D spinner pair space can make any general 2x2 two two matrix with complex entries. Also note that this map turns a single vector index into two spinner indices. 
So in some sense, one vector index is worth two spinner indices. We can apply this sigma map to any tensor T that we like, and replace every tensor index with a pair of spinner indices. This is why spinners can be thought of as a tensor of rank 1 half. A vector, which is a rank 1 tensor, is equivalent to the product of a pair of spinners, each of rank 1 half. And a single vector index requires two spinner indices to be represented. And as seen in previous videos, when physical space is rotated by an angle theta, the pair of spinners in the corresponding spinner spaces each rotate with half that angle, theta over 2. The last thing I'll mention is that, just as it's possible to change basis in our ordinary 3D vector space V, it's also possible to change basis in our spinner space S. For example, we can double the length of our S1 basis spinner. Since dual basis spinners are contravariant, the dual basis spinner S1 must transform in the opposite way, with multiplication by one half. So our change of basis equations for spinners and dual spinners are here, and we can rearrange these so that the tilde basis is on the right side of the equal sign. If we take a generic element of our spinner pair space, written in the original basis, we can change to the tilde basis by applying these equations one by one to each term in the sum. The 1, 1 term gets a factor of 1 half and 2 that cancel. The 2, 1 term gets a factor of 2. The 1, 2 term gets a factor of 1 half. And the 2, 2 term gets no additional factor. This gives the same object, but written in the tilde basis instead. You can see here that there are some extra numerical factors in front of some components. We can also write the new components as V tilde. So both of these formulas are just different ways of writing the same output from the sigma map. But because they are written in different bases, they give us different components, and they correspond to different matrices. Again, the components in the new basis can be written with V tilde. In this new spinner basis, the components of the sigma matrices would now contain these factors, meaning the sigma matrices would now look like this. Now, we won't be changing spinner basis very often in this video series, but just keep in mind it's something that can be done, and it will affect the components of the sigma matrices. So to sum up this video, just as vectors live in vector spaces, and dual vectors live in dual vector spaces, we have spinners that live in spinner spaces, and dual spinners that live in dual spinner spaces. Spinner spaces obey all the rules of linear algebra that would be expected from vector spaces. But there is a special linear map sigma that maps vectors from 3D space, into the space of spinner, dual spinner, tensor products. This is where Pauli vectors and the sigma matrices live, and it explains why we can factor certain Pauli vectors into a spinner and a dual spinner. The linear map sigma has 12 coefficients, and it converts one tensor index into a pair of spinner indices. In the next video, when we cover spinners in four-dimensional space-time, the equivalent sigma map will be a 4x4 matrix, and its components are called the Infeld van der Waarden symbols.